Hello out there. I'm going to tell you about Minnie Chadwick, the darling of the Darby Creek Valley. Darby Creek Valley is just south and west of Philadelphia, and it actually historically is the first interior route for the first Europeans into the interior of Pennsylvania. Now they didn't go very far, they only went up uh, about six miles, and that is the area of Addingham. And most of Addingham, uh, which was named for a uh, Yorkshire uh, textile community that for hundreds of years had made uh, materials be before some of the people came to America and settled just outside Philadelphia. Uh, most of it, as I started to say, was on East Bank. And that's where many Chadwick, who I'm going to talk to you about, uh, lived. Now, there's a stream called Bloomfield Avenue, and it goes straight west and the north-south Darby Creek. When he, Bloomfield Avenue gets right to the creek, it takes a dog legs to the south. And just facing on the, you know, at the base of the hill toward Darby Creek was Minnie Chadwick's house. And she loved Addingham. She thought the Darby Creek Valley was, and Addingham was the best of all places in the world. And she started working, just like her older sister, Lillian, a, a year before, uh, when she was uh, 13 years old. And she worked in the textile mill, mostly uh, the, the, the Nelson Kershaw Glenwood Mill. What I want to tell you today is just how I got the very best stories from many. All right. Her, when she was getting up in age, uh, she, she collected stuff. Uh, mica flake rocks, which are, you know, uh, reflect light. They have little, like, uh, pieces of uh, thin uh, mica in it that uh, the uh, the glass of early ovens used to have. It was somewhat transparent. And she would put them right beside her the steps in her sun porch, which faced the Darby Creek. And I used to visit her in the afternoon when the sun was pouring in, and she had two green rockers. And she'd sit on the one, and she would, I'd be the, the one near the door and the step up into it. And she said, Tom, get me one of the rocks. And I would go over, and while she could see, she went along the creek, and she collected these rocks that were mica flaked. And I would go over, I, I knew what to do, I'd give her one, and she'd put it in her lap. The sun would be pouring in. She'd start rocking, and with her head down and her eyes upon that rock, the sun would reflect up off the little flecks of mica, and her dimmed eyes would pick up on the reflection. And with the rocking and the looking back and me and having her think back to 1900, she would, I promise this is true, I'm convinced I had it done over and over again, she would self-hypnotize herself and tell the most marvelous stories. And that the, the uh, oh, there the, were the, the just wonderful stories, and I want to share some. The uh, one was that now this is industry, the film industry, silent film industry began on the East Coast, and started by Thomas Edison, but a group of them, the the the, the most brilliant was a gentleman by the name of Pop Sigmund Lubin, and that the. the he would come out to Darby Creek with his film crew and film. And I mentioned how many worked for quite a while at the Nelson Kershaw Glenwood Mill. Well, there was a, a second pond, as she called it, and between the, the mill and the stream, and it was where waste would be. Well, one time, and she remembers this so very well, watching a cloud. You know, all dressed up, you know, head to toe, uh, big giant uh, shoes like a clown would have, and uh, looked very silly. And he had a rod, and he starts to cast and recast into the into the sapling pond. And all of a sudden, after a little bit, he gets a, a bite, and all the antics were going to and fro, and then all of a sudden he's turning. Now he's turning, you know, like. As if he's using all his might and marching, trying to go, you know, pull this thing. And it's back and forth, and he's ha it, he was a marvelous uh, comic. Well, all of a sudden, in this little short, 
They had an inflatable, inflatable whale-like fish that flew and then pits him, and he just rolls in somersaults. Now, many, uh, with some of her friends, would go to downtown Philadelphia to what they called dime museums back then, where they showed the first uh, motion pictures. And she remembers particularly seeing this one that she watched. Now, when she got a little older, she actually was not watching from like the creek side and out of sight, but as a worker inside the mill. And this drove Nelson Kershaw and his sons, the, you know, the supper operators and owners of this, crazy because there was no air conditioning. There were big, huge windows. And the workers, when Lubin was filming on that side or within sight at a log cabin across the creek, they would, at every opportunity, be toward the windows or their heads looking not at what they were doing, but watching some of the early motion pictures. And they were done about 1902 to 1908. And in 1912, he moved up to Bettswoods, uh, B-E-L-T-Z-W-O-O-D-S, which hugs Valley Forge uh, right outside Philadelphia. And I suspect he came back to Darby Creek every once in a while, but he formally settled up in 1912 at Bettswood. The reason you don't really hear so much about uh, Sigmund Lubin, he had a great fire in 1916. The other thing is that he was the first filmmaker that would send his films worldwide. He wrote the book on it. But what happened in 1914, the European First World War began, and his market uh, just shriveled the world market, which he had developed so um, princely and, for, and it was so a good share of his business. The other thing is that the building, the stone building that he had the very highly ex explosive and, and, and burnable uh, negatives burnt in 1916 and there's only fragments and short films. Very, I mean, I don't know that there's a single real film. There's a couple of shorts, but usually they're, they're fragments that, that survive. Anyway, many told lots of stories and I'll just tell one last story. My two boys were, when they were you know, a few years age, uh, they're only one year apart, I would take older Billy and his younger brother Nolan to this place. And back in Minnie's place was this hillside. And she had a little path and she had like flowers, more large flowers, and she had a beautiful uh, oak trees and the like. And, it was, and she just loved her garden. Anyway, we would go, when my sons would visit with her, with, with me, we'd go in the back. And anyway, a year later, she died. And a year afterward, I asked Billy and Nolan, do you remember Manny Chadwick? And they sort of put a puzzled look on their, their faces. And all of a sudden, together in unison, talk about, you know, uh, sort of a joint ESP, they both said, oh, the acorn lady, because in the back, the, the acorns would hit the stamp and then roll down, and they remembered the flowers in the garden. Many who loved all things, you know, of wildlife and plants and the like, there's no sort of better title that she'd like to be remembered by as the one that my kids gave Minnie Chadwick, the acorn lady. Of course, I've done talks, and I call her the Darby of the Darby Creek Valley. And I hope today you enjoy that, that little story about her.